this is gonna be a funny question, but I refer to you as Neuroflex. What is your full name? My name is Toby Passman. You actually might be thinking that because for a period of time, I actually didn't have my name on Instagram. That's maybe when we connected. Right. Because I was basically in the process of getting, like, changing the name. I was getting, like, you know that you can, like, buy names from Instagram? Like, specific really? You? Yeah, yeah, So I have a buddy. I didn't know this prior to a few weeks ago. But I have a buddy who has, like, an Instagram rep that he connected me with. So previously, my name was, like, Neuroflex Florida. But I wanted just the Neuroflex tag. So in order to do that, there were, like, a lot of requirements. Instagram asks you to, like, take out like the actual, like your actual name and everything else. So like, as I was in the process of getting that new username, I just had everything wiped clean. So I was just, people kept calling me Neuroflex. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's cool that they do that. I remember I was so stressed out trying to get the damn good day URL. Ah. And uh, one day it was just available. Like I was just scrolling. I was like, oh my God, it's available. It was exciting. Yeah. I was like, let's go. All the ones that like, I mean, you I mean, maybe you could like buy it from other people, but you know, if, if there's ever like an account, like you might try to That's make it. has been there for like four years, hasn't done shit. Like that, or even like some, like Neuroflex, what, there wasn't even an account that had the Neuroflex app. It was like inactive, but I guess someone owned the rights to it or something. So yeah. Instagram, you just pay them and they just give it to you. So Well, man, I'm so excited <laughs> for you to be here. I am a huge admirer of your work. You Appreciate are that. really leading the charge in this uh, and paving the way into new technology and new ways of looking at the human body that I've never done before. And uh, also great to hear that one of the first things we talked about is how you put your Neuroflex device on, did MDMA and saw how it changed it. <laughs> and uh, that's awesome for yeah. science. For science, all for science. for science. So I'm really excited though, but all, all jokes aside, I mean, you know, it's it's fascinating as our generation is becoming woke to the realities that seed oils are in everything we do that, you know, heavy metals are deep inside of all of our skin and in our bodies. And this whole idea of trying to detox from all of the shit that society puts into us, we're finally starting to wake up and people are getting fired up about it. So I think we're in this huge pivotal turning point when so many old industries are going to die and so many new ones are going to start to grow and I see your niche and where you're at being one of those big industries. Yeah, man. I mean, I feel like honestly, like biohacking as a whole, and I, I feel like what I do is definitely falls under that category of kind of biohacking, neurohacking. I remember back in like 2013, 2014, when Dave Asprey just had a little bulletproof blog and there was like a tiny little store associated with it, but there was like no one talking about it. I remember in high school, anyone I talked to about biohacking or just the idea that the food that I was eating, you know, I was eating food specifically to improve my brain performance. And like the idea of that was just absurd. People looked at me like I was crazy. So it's super cool to see several years later, just how, you know, it's gone really mainstream. 1000%. It's also cool to see all the mutual connections we have upon you coming here. Yes. And it's great that people that take chances and put themselves out there, good things happen to them. Man, I mean, Miami, honestly, it's a good place to be just to, I guess, like a lot of big cities where it's just like you end up meeting a lot of cool, interesting people. And I felt like I always kind of had the idea to do my business in South Florida Yeah. because I grew, up, I grew up in Oregon and small town in Oregon, Eugene, and I felt like it wouldn't really work. This idea wouldn't really work too well down there. So I always kind of envision just coming to Florida and doing this and yeah, met some amazing people here. I feel like everyone I meet in Miami has always got an interesting backstory and are you know doing something really cool. So let's start. What is exactly what is exactly is it that you do? How does these brain scans work? And um, give us like the high level. Right, right. So brain scans is a kind of encompassing term that includes what I do is brain mapping, which is a technology that basically measures the electrical activity of the brain, aka brain waves. So these are the rhythms that our brain utilizes to communicate with itself. These rhythms produce our thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and cognitive abilities, really creating all of our consciousness. So in addition to like the neurochemicals, your dopamine, serotonin, the brain works both on chemicals as well as electricity. So in order to accurately assess the chemicals in your brain, we'd have to do a spinal tap. And that's going to be a bit difficult to convince you to do a spinal tap, right? No one's going to want a huge needle in their back. So 
Instead, a lot of the research has been focused on measuring the electrical activity, which you can do non-invasively through an EEG, an electroencephalogram, which is like a swim cap looking device. Mm-hmm. Or at least I actually have, I've done three EEGs because oh, I had you. spinal issues in the back. Ah, and uh, okay. so I'm familiar with the, all the different zappings and the, right. the needles and all that. Right. Right. Unfortunately. Right. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. But so it's, it's sort of a repurposing or a different purpose of that technology where, you know, neurologists use EEGs for sleep disorders and seizure, measuring seizure activity, whereas psychiatry and mental health practitioners utilize it to measure, you know, and assess depression, anxiety, uh, insomnia, different things like that. And then there's also the peak performance use for it. So where I've positioned my company is really executives, entrepreneurs, athletes, other high performers who are looking for the performance maximization just to be the best um, they can be. There's also the use for that. So there's a variety of different uses, but you know, it's been around since like the 19... 1970s i would say eeg has actually been around since the 1930s the first one was done way back by a a german psychiatrist hans berger so that's what it actually is though an eeg of the brain so it's an eeg and then what the brain mapping is is what's called a q eeg or a quantified eeg so you basically take that raw eeg data you run it through this mathematical algorithm which makes me sound a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> I don't actually know <laughs> the, pretty smart the specific guy. mathematics of it, but um, it basically then produces the, these heat maps. So we can actually visualize areas of the brain that are underactive or overactive in each of the frequencies. So it shows up as you know lighter colors being underactivity, warmer colors being overactivity. So it's basically a way to physically or visually represent that data rather than just seeing a bunch of those squiggly lines on the screen. It doesn't necessarily mean a ton to the average person that's looking at it, whereas the actual images, you can really see what's going on in your brain. Interesting. So, you know, I think about having a long history of dealing with gut issues, SIBO and things like that. And when I had chronic inflammation in my body, my brain fog was up through the roof. I had insane fatigue and all the different things that associate with it. Have you seen that patients that are experiencing things like that have vastly different brain scans than let's say like someone super healthy and running marathons definitely so so there's a specific brain wave called delta it's the slowest of the brain waves you see it mostly in really deep sleep when someone's completely unconscious but when we see waking delta when someone produces a lot of delta in an awake state with their eyes open that is a very common indicator of neural inflammation so whether that's inflammation from uh, you know heavy metals mold toxicity diet past head injuries you know it doesn't necessarily tell us the source of the inflammation but it is reflecting you know gray and white matter damage that is resulting from neural inflammation so that's something that we're able to assess where it's that kind of inflammatory pattern and then there's different modalities that can be uh, you know, used to combat that. But yes, definitely someone with a lot of neural inflammation, their brain looks very different, almost more like someone's brain in a sleep state. Yeah, it's really interesting uh, because inflammation is the killer, right? I mean, I had this really effed up situation where I got LASIK eye surgery and my gut was so inflamed that it hit after I'd gotten the surgery and my eyes never healed. And I ended up having neuropathic eye pain because essentially the nerves behind my eyes didn't grow like a nightmare situation. And it's crazy because everyone was so confused of what's going on. How's this happening? And then we all came out to this doctor at Tufts medical, Dr. Wu shout out. She's amazing. And she explained that the inflammation that you're experiencing in your gut is, is what's causing your eyes not to heal from the surgery. So I'm a huge believer in all this stuff. And for everyone that's listening, I'm sure you are too, because you've been listening to this podcast for a long time. And I'm, I'm curious, do you do brain scans? Like, let's say, you know, you scan me and I'm, I'm a massive giant red flag. When people get their health better, can they see the changes in the brain? Yeah. And that's honestly the coolest part I think about what I do is that you can actually see, you know, visually, you know, how your brain is actually changing and improving as the result of whatever sort of intervention, whether it's neurofeedback, uh, one of the training technologies that I utilize with clients, or if it's someone, you know, fixing their gut, detoxing off of different things, 
You know, I worked at a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center in uh, Deerfield Beach for a couple oh, years. So cool. that was really interesting seeing people. That was been unique. Very. Never a dull moment there. <laughs> but it was super interesting, you know, seeing people come in and they're, you know, on coming off of you know, methamphetamines, heroin, you know, uh, drinking a fifth of whiskey a night and seeing their brain scans at first were really pretty bad, you know, the, the worst, of the worst, but then you could see, you know, significant improvements even in relatively short periods of time. So that's really my main message to people is that no matter where you're at currently, your brain can change if you know, you know, wh what's wrong and then how to change it in the right direction. But they used to think neuroscientists used to think a few decades ago um, that our brains were kind of just fixed after adolescence, that our brains weren't able to really change and rewire themselves. But we now know that's been completely debunked. So our brain is constantly changing, growing new neurons, new connections among cells. Even they've seen this in people into their 90s. So our brains are always malleable and neuroplasticity is resulting in, you know, our ability to change our brain, hopefully for the better. It also works the, in the reverse direction where say you're completely healthy and then you have a head injury or you experience a super traumatic event and have P then get PTSD. It can work in that direction too, where you can, your brain can go from healthy to unhealthy very quickly, but it can also, you know, hopefully get a lot healthier. Have you flirted with the ideas that people are talking about with Neuralink? Ah, uh, definitely. I made a video about it. Yeah, it's it's super interesting. And when I first heard about it, I was like, man, if it was anyone besides Elon Musk saying this, I was like, I would have totally not believed it was possible. But the more that keeps getting like shared about it, I'm like, damn, he's really he did happening. it again. It's really happening. Yeah, so I know they're, they started some studies looking, they're specifically trying to see if they can get people who can't walk, talk, or there's some, some other like very severe conditions. They're trying to see if they yeah. can implant this brain chip and see if, if they can improve someone. So that's, I think it's the future for sure. That's gnarly. But how did you get into this world? Was there like a certain experience that you had that struck deep to your soul that made you just want to do this? Because you're all in. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, part of that's just my nature. It's like, I have a very, I want to say addictive necessarily, but like obsessive, like whenever I get into something, like I'm like all in, like right now I'm like doing this credit stacking course. It's like using business credit, credit cards. I'm like, my girlfriend's like, you did the entire course in like two weeks. I'm like, I'm like kind of just crazy like, like that. Travel hacking. Yeah. Like kind of. Yeah. Like stacking credit cards, like where you can get all these like specific business cards, 0% interest. Anyway, that's what, a, what was the biggest takeaway from that course? Um, just that anyone with like an LLC can access like upwards of $250,000 of 0% interest business funding. If you know the right banks to set up relationships with and all that stuff, the right credit cards to get. So whole world I, I didn't know anything about but well we had sky remember we had jan stavisky on the podcast he's the guy that his name's on instagram it's like credit king or something like that uh, yeah, yeah. king credit yeah. oh yes. oh interesting there's there's a different dude on instagram jack mccall who i'm doing his course he's king of debt so oh. that's interesting king of credit king of debt i wonder if they're like rivals or competitors name, maybe, yeah, yeah. He's intense. But, he's like, he travels the world. He's been like 65 countries. He, he got super rich. Now right. he flexes hard and uh, I'm happy for him. Yeah. But he, uh, he teaches travel hacking. Okay. And it's interesting because it's such a good pitch, right? You see someone, I just got this, you know, five star hotel at the Ritz Carlton for 150 bucks. Learn how and get into my inner circle for just a thousand dollars. You're sitting there just like, bullshit take my money you know it's such a good pitch <laughs> yeah it's interesting just being in sales and just meeting a lot of humans like the pitch like what makes people want to do what they do mm -hmm. and that's a compelling one so all those dudes that know how to travel hack and they know how to leverage credit cards and be able to get all those rewards i mean that's a sick skill to have yeah and it's like hacking it's like credit hacking and it's like biohacking it's like when you understand how to get into the inner workings of your biology and yeah. impact the way your body and brain function. That's also a huge, huge thing. So it's almost like a similar, similar methodology. Yeah. I'm but, really, I'm really fired up about this. And because literally I dedicated the next six months to just go all in on my health and wellness and nutrition. 
you know, I've always had like one foot in one foot out, never mm-hmm. really wanted to self identify as, you know, a wellness coach. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've found more and more that I guess as I get older and things start to hurt more and life starts to get more stationary that I want to live healthy. I want to live happy. And those days where I, you know, get fucked up and have a few drinks and feel like shit the next day, it's like very rarely worth it, you know? So I'm just trying to find a way to maximize health, maximize the feelings of joy and happiness. Like the other day when it was 71 degrees in Miami, it was like the, the air was breezy and you walk outside, you're just like, yeah, like let's go, baby. Right. Like this is the vibe. And it starts with healing your body, healing your brain and all of this stuff. Definitely. Definitely. And, and just circling back to the question, I know I went off on a tangent, a fun tangent there. For sure. But to answer your question, as far as like how I actually got into this stuff myself, I definitely did, um, you know, have some certain experiences growing up where, you know, there were some family members I had that were affected by some pretty serious mental health conditions. And I actually lost someone really close to me to suicide at a young age. So really going through that experience, I think really showed me firsthand just first, like, the inadequacy of traditional mental health treatment. You know, so many people are prescribed SSRIs, other antidepressants that just are very ineffective, that have all these side effects. And then also just, you know, kind of the devastating effects, like the ripple down effect of when that happens with one person, just how it can impact an entire family, an entire, you know, culture really with like how many veterans we're losing, you know, to suicides on a daily basis. So Really, I think that from a young age kind of instilled in me that, you know, kind of desire to kind of figure out what's going on here and try to do something to improve it. And then I would also say like growing up in high school, I used to have like really bad social anxiety. So I was like, could not form like good, solid friendships like with with dudes, let alone dating, you know, was impossible for me. I always sucked with girls growing up. So it was like always the big pain point where I was like just trying to figure out my own social issues. And at some point I kind of realized that, okay, this is the result of how my brain is functioning on a biological level. The fact that I'm getting all in this fight or flight response, you know, whenever I'm in a social situation, the fact that I, I could never think of the right word to say. So my verbal fluency was really off. And I actually did when I first did a brain scan on myself, I saw that an area of my left frontal lobe that is really important for verbal fluency and speech production, that area was actually really underactive. So it helped me connect so many dots of like, aha, this is why I've always experienced this issue, not because of some like moral failing, which I was like, and you know, a lot of people, I think really there's a stigma around mental health. I think it's getting better, but you know, people feel as though it's like, damn, why can't I just not be depressed or not be anxious. They feel ashamed that they can't solve it or that they've been to years of therapy like I had and just hadn't made progress. But when, you know, it's a biological problem, you could, you can't talk your way out of that, no matter if you're seeing the best therapist in the world. So really it was like that experience. And uh, then going through neurofeedback training, as I was like working at a research lab in college where I was like learning and measuring other people's brainwave patterns and kind of understanding the inner workings of the brain. And then also experiencing how specifically training that left frontal lobe for, in my case, that area really important for verbal fluency, seeing how that actually resulted in me feeling so much more at ease just talking with people because I stopped having to almost like think and pre-plan what I was going to say in my head. I just, you know, like I was like a weirdo, like, (laughs) like trying to like, because I I just felt so uncomfortable and never could remember the right word to say. So I would just almost like have like a rehearsed response, you know, of what I was going to say to someone. And then it just came off super, you know, awkward. And then it was just a self-perpetuating cycle where I just felt more and more uncomfortable in social situations. So by really targeting and training that area of my brain, I began just feeling like so much more social fluidity, so much more at ease and comfortable. And the more that I did the sessions, I started noticing like when I first started doing the sessions, it was like the first, you know, maybe like for a couple hours after the session, I would feel like calm and relaxed. And then I, you know, my symptoms would come back. Right. But the more I did the repetition, the more when I got up to like 15, 20, 25 sessions, I started noticing 
that it was almost creating a new baseline. So like regardless of whether I did another session or not, I still felt at ease and comfortable in social wow. situations. My verbal fluency had gotten so much better and that effect just continued to compound the more that I did it. Whoa. And so that subjective experience was super cool, but I've always been like a science, like data driven person. So when I actually saw my follow-up brain scan that showed how my brain that specifically that left frontal lobe had actually stabilized and improved in its functionality, actually being able to see the before and after images, it was so validating as it is with so many other people. It's like, ah, here was the problem. Now I feel better. And I actually, I can see how my brain actually looks better. That's so. crazy. So they, you saw the front uh, lobe of your brain was not doing good. So how many different areas of the brain are there? Um, there, it depends how you want from to define mapping. it. So from the mapping, so there's basically 19 different, what are called channels. So like the cap that you've probably seen, you know, on the Instagram, like the, the swim cap looking device, it's measuring 19 different areas of the brain. So there's the prefrontal cortex that sits right behind the forehead. That's really mm -hmm. important for executive functioning, you know, planning, organizing, judgment, decision-making. It's the area of our brain that really goes offline when we, when we drink, you know, Think about the what occurs when someone gets drunk, right? They just say the first thing that comes to mind. They do stupid shit. They end yeah. up regretting. That's the prefrontal cortex going completely offline. It's the same reason that teenagers make really bad decisions oftentimes because that's the last area of the brain to develop. So that's a really key one that we measure. And then also the frontal lobes. So teenagers get a pass. Teenagers get a pass because, yeah, their brains are still finishing cooking. But, that's gnarly. Um, yeah. So there's, there's those areas. Um, there's the temporal lobes that sit like right above and behind our ears. Those are really important for mood as well as memory. Then there's the parietal lobes, which are kind of towards the back, not all the way in the back, but kind of towards the back part of our brain, almost where the, uh, kind of that bald spot can be sometimes. Yeah. Right. Um, and those lobes are really important for like sensory integration. So when just, you know, feeling, seeing, just there was all of our senses, it gets processed by the parietal lobes and that sort of integrates, you know, into our experience of the world. And then lastly, there's the occipital lobes, the very back uh, area of the brain that is really devoted to vision and visual processing. And then actually I forgot, there's um, another kind of midline structure of the brain uh, that runs, runs right down the, the center of the brain called the cingulate cortex. And that's a, not a lobe per se, but it's another area of the brain that we assess with the brain map. I call that area, I like to think of it as like the gear shifter of the brain. Right. So when people get stuck in repetitive thoughts and worries and maybe compulsions, uh, that area is oftentimes overactive. It's kind of like the hamster wheel of the brain where it just goes and goes and goes and um, people can struggle with all those symptoms. I'm curious about the training aspect. So like, with your brain specifically, there was that certain area that was, was showing inflammation or was, or was not operating correctly. Right. Have, do we have it dialed where pretty much any part of that brain mapping, there are certain exercises that we can do to improve them or how close are we to, to be able to like directly sort of, you know, put a patch where, where it needs to be. Right. So there's a variety of neurotechnologies. I mean, there's, there's multiple different things that impact the way our brain functions, right? Like I tell people, it's like the foundations of good brain health, nutrition, sleep, exercise, you know, all the stuff that's really not sexy, but is going to be super important just in having a healthy brain. Yeah. But when it comes to training specific areas, there's a variety of technologies that I utilize. The one that I used mostly and that I work with clients mostly on now is called neurofeedback. So this is a, a training modality where basically it's picking up your brainwave activity through the use of these electrodes. So these sensors that you can place at various different points along the scalp. But instead of just measuring what's going on, which is what the brain map does, neurofeedback actually provides the brain feedback, real-time feedback, like within 100 mil uh, milliseconds which is quicker than our conscious mind can even process information. So it's giving our brain like real, real time feedback on when it's doing well versus when it needs to self adjust. So someone's like playing like a video game, say on the screen, you could choose different characters, but say there's like a, a spaceship game, right? And you're trying basically when your brain is producing the healthy brainwave patterns, 
you'll see the spaceship fly higher and the audio will get louder. So it's like providing the brain a reward, yeah. like operant conditioning, telling the brain when it's doing well. And then that reward is taken away when the brain gets into an unhealthy state. So the audio gets quiet, the spaceship starts flying lower. So the brain then gets a sense of when it's doing well and versus when it versus when it needs to adjust. So this is something that over time the brain is able, you know, because of neuroplasticity, the brain is able to learn a healthier means of firing and is able to either increase or decrease its production of a different brain wave in order to, you know, in my case, really improve my verbal fluency, but Neurofeedback's been studied for conditions like ADHD, anxiety, depression, traumatic brain injury, insomnia, all right. sorts of different things. Well, you're very well spoken, so you're a product of the product. I I appreciate it, man. I I go to people at conferences now and like talk to people that I tell them my story and they just like don't believe me that I'm like, no, like really, if you <laughs> met me five years ago, like I was a different person. Like yeah, you're dialed. Yeah. I mean, this stuff, it, it really did work for me in addition to like psychedelic yeah. uh, experiences. Like, um, really, I felt like that was what able type of psychedelic experiences for me. MDMA was always like I had an experience, a couple experiences with MDMA where I feel like I got to the root of like all my social anxiety. Like I had this like breakthrough. We were like partying at this villa in Miami Beach. Um, Shout out to my boy Nizar if he's listening. Shout out Nizar. <laughs> but uh, we're basically like, I had this experience where all of a sudden, like I felt like really weird in my body. Like I'd, I'd previously taken MDMA a few nights prior for the first time and felt great. Yeah. It was just partying all night. But this time I felt super weird and like really like in my head, like I was just like completely detached and isolated from like talking to anyone else there. I was like one, wondering like what was going on because the previous, the few nights ago, it was amazing. So I pulled my buddy aside. We started talking and then all of a sudden it just like hit me like a ton of bricks. I blurted out that I feel like everyone's always judging me. And I said that, and I, dude, I just started like crying, like pouring down tears. Like, Damn. and I, you know, for like a lot of guys, you know, like right. growing up, we, we bottle in our emotions. Absolutely. We don't show emotion. You gotta be a man. Gotta be a man. So like, I, it was like this dump of all of this, like emotional baggage that I'd been carrying on to not even knowing it. And like, after that experience, it was this like cathartic experience. And afterwards I was able to interact with everyone that night at this like party that we we're at. Um, not really a party, like casual kickback, but they yeah, were also yeah. rolling, but like everyone else that I interacted with at this party. I was able to look them directly in the eyes without feeling any sort of shame or judgment, like all these things that had always just, I'd always experienced as part of my social anxiety and always worrying about what other people were thinking of me. I was able to like experience this world that was like just this pure consciousness of not, not being self uh, critical or, you know, self judgmental. So having that experience, it was like, even though I can't, you know, the drug got out of my system, but having that experience never left, Whoa. you know, it was like, always knowing that that was what, that was like the end goal of kind of what my life could look like if I was able to get, you know, and conquer yeah. some of my social anxiety. Cause man, I had like, at that point I was like 21, 22 and like never had a girlfriend before didn't really have like super deep good friendships you just had all these things holding you down all these things holding me down that i never could never get to the root of and then with that experience like after that that was also the time like i was doing started doing neuro, uh, neurofeedback was already seeing benefits but then it just seemed to really work really synergistically with that to, i think just iron in those changes and everything in my life started changing i started having a great group of friends like that i'd always wanted you know, super, super good people and, you know, got my first girlfriend and just l life changed around so much after that. And you were, yeah, you were, I just, you were cruising. I was cruising. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy, man, where it's like people talk about, oh, you know, the, how, how drugs can fuck up your life. Yeah. Which is certain drugs definitely can, but for me, like my life was fucked up before drugs and it's then so, drugs helped unfuck my life. It's so interesting that, that exists like that 
soundbite right there because the reality is is that drugs do have such a huge stigma on them but then Mm -hmm. you see these like ketamine assisted facilities and how they're becoming more normalized and how drugs which first of all we've been taking drugs for a long time but pharmaceutical drugs um but how certain drugs like mushrooms and different forms of cannabis if you want to even consider that a, a drug Um, can be able to, you know, really open up a whole new world for certain people. Now, naturally, never everything's going to be 100%. And I, you know, the the king Joe Rogan says that everyone should do psychedelics besides like people that are at really high risk of being able to be, you know, changed, if that makes sense. Right. And we we have a good friend, Laza. She's like, uh, she speaks a lot about all sorts of different psychedelics and and different drugs and therapies. And she said that a lot of times before you do drugs, you have to really know yourself and you know who you are, because Mm -hmm. if you don't, sometimes you can almost lose who you are. But if you Mm. have a a good sense of like foundationally who you are, then sometimes like drugs can be amazing when you go like deep into a trip and come back. What are your thoughts on that? I haven't heard it put exactly like that before, but it makes a lot of sense just speaking on my own experience where... I felt like I was always like very, very self-aware, like almost to a fault. Like I knew exactly what my problems were, maybe even why I was having them, but that didn't take away from the fact that I was still experiencing all these social anxiety issues. So it was like, I think like cognitively you can grasp, like if you have that grasp of what's going on, that's, you know, that, that helps. But all of the people who talk to a therapist for years and aren't getting changes the way i think about it is that you know neuroscientists estimate that like only five percent of our overall brain activity is conscious whereas 95 percent of it is all under the surface all those subconscious programs so therapy like talking to someone's really only getting at that five percent conscious level neurofeedback you know is giving you feedback quicker than our conscious mind can even process information and then also psychedelics working really on the subconscious mind. So I think like maybe having that initial conscious awareness of my problem, but then still having like all of this muck under the surface that I I couldn't quite clear out. And, but I had like the conscious awareness of like what I wanted my life to look like, like what I wanted, what problems I wanted to get rid of. And then the psychedelic kind of allowed me to the way I think of it, it's kind of like do some like uh, psychological surgery, yeah. right? And get in under the surface and get all the, the bad shit out. So what are other like what are some other crazy success stories that you've seen with clients of yours using psychedelics and, and forming that or, or maybe just crazy discoveries that kind of blew your brain? Yeah, man. Um, with psychedelics, I mean, I've heard all sorts of different things. Um, I mean, I, I don't work actually with clients utilizing psychedelics. Like I, I more so just, you know, I'm doing the neurofeedback training. Yeah. Uh, so I could probably speak more, more upon that. Um, I mean, I definitely have plenty of friends and clients who've shared experiences with that, but just kind of firsthand seeing people, you know, go through neurofeedback. It's also, it oftentimes is almost similar as far as like, the benefits that people see yeah. as far as these changes and in, in rewiring the subconscious. I view psychedelics and neurofeedback or brain training as like almost like just adjacent modalities. Like I go to psychedelic conferences and speak and because it's, it's such a similar, the way I view it, it's like psychedelics kind of increase neuroplasticity to allow you to kind of rewire and change your brain on a, on a drug level you know, with with taking something, whereas neurofeedback and other neurotechnologies help you do that just on a technological level. Got it. So I think oftentimes, you know, it's similar, similar things, but I've, I've seen clients, you know, uh, there's this one woman, um, who's like really, really struck me as, as a great example of just how your brain can change even at a, at a later age, she was in her mid, actually, I think late sixties and she was having a lot of anxiety, um, racing thoughts. She couldn't sleep at night, uh, memory issues. And also she'd have like, she had like a hand tremor. Like anytime I saw her, this low level kind of hand tremor and, you know, her daughter was thinking kind of like early onset Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, something like that. And we did a brain scan on her. She, her brain map looked terrible. Like one of the worst that I've seen, 
but she went through a round of doing neurofeedback training and also, you know, cutting out some things from her diet, like sugar, grains, dairy, put her on like an elimination diet and also had her do hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which is a great modality just to drive more blood flow and oxygen to the brain. And with that combination of things, I mean, her brain map, it was like night and day different. And I was like, I really was not sure whether I could help this woman. And I was very transparent. I was like, I, this, this is pretty severe. And like, I don't know, like neurodegenerative issues can be so difficult. I mean, once things get to a point where the brain starts breaking down, it can be very difficult to slow or, you know, reverse anything. But just seeing that, seeing the results she had, you know, her hand right. tremor started only occurring when she got really anxious. So pretty much got like mostly better. Her memory improved, her anxiety got a lot better and she was actually sleeping through the night. So so many things improved and then just seeing her brain scan look so much better showed me like what was possible of someone even even at a later age damn so that's so freaking phenomenal there is fascinating because yeah. it makes you think what if every single human was forced to get these brain scans and what if everyone was almost required to do these types of trainings and, and we'd be able to catch issues way before they become problems i i totally agree i think in the same way that you go into your doctor to get your le- yearly lab work right or at least you know they tell you you're supposed to <laughs> you know if you were to do a brain scan then you could actually see say one year you go into the doctor's appointment and you're saying hey you know i've been having anxiety and depression this year like what's what's going on then you would actually have a baseline to compare it to that's the problem so oftentimes with clients that i work with who are you know they've they've come to me cuz they're they've had a traumatic brain injury, a concussion or or something else that's happened. And they're wondering like, well, how much of this is because of the head injury and how much of this is just how my brain always was. I'm like, well, we don't have a baseline, so we don't know. But if, if we did what I'm saying, where it was just during a, during a routine physical, during your routine physical. Um, I mean, I honestly, are there any negatives to it? Like brain mapping? No. Cause that's just measuring, you know, what's going on. Like some people, it's actually more uh, pretty frequently people are really scared to see like their results. Um, you know, I, I think it, it can be like a pretty intimate look into your issues and for people who might not want to, you know, take action to do for something. Sure. It's scary. It's, it can be, I scary. mean, I'm, I'm low, low key scared to see what my brain yeah. is, but everything with health is scary. And you need to embrace where you're at and create a health plan. Because if you have a health plan, then it's not scary anymore. And I I think, honestly, if you think about what's scarier is severe depression that runs your life or neurodegenerated, you know, having a neurodegenerative disease that prevents you from being able to spend time with your grandkids and see them grow up. You know, there's, if you think about the the scariness of, of in the moment, kind of seeing something that's a problem, but you can actually do something about it. You know, that's the thing is that if I was just doing a brain scan on someone, it was like, ah, well, there's nothing re- we can really do. You're, you're kind of screwed like <laughs> that. You know, I wouldn't want to get a brain scan on myself, yeah. but because we can do so many things to change the brain, I always tell people no matter where they're at, there's always things that they can do to improve the way their brain works. So totally. it's better to And it know. all starts in the brain. everything starts in the brain we focus so much on topical stuff for everything else but the brain never gets a lot of love till ld little (laughs) dicky dropped the brain in one of his albums oh you know who little dicky is yeah i know he is who you never know the fictional character of the brain i didn't i haven't been following there's this thing called pillow talking with little dicky and he fictionized the brain it's phenomenal i'll have to look that up but uh here's a question for you yeah out of all the different brain stems uh, out of all the different brain scans you've done what is the most common thing that you see definitely an excess of what are called high beta brain waves so beta is basically the brain wave involved in focus concentration alertness but there's a specific subset of beta so basically a little to back up a little bit when we're talking about brain waves they're divided based on the frequency like how many cycles per second they're occurring so yeah this is perfect for people who are watching the video because it was a little difficult to explain this but yeah basically with the brain waves 
um, you, um, you can basically measure how many cycles per second they're occurring. So beta is a frequency that ranges from 30 up to about 30 hertz or 30 cycles per second. So anything upwards of 20 hertz, it's like that 20 to 30 hertz high beta, it's kind of known as the bad beta. That's a super common pattern that indicates that someone's in like a chronic fight or flight response, which is what so many people, you know, in today's society where we're just bombarded with constant stimulation with social media and all the pressures and obligations that we have, like a lot of us are stuck in that chronic fight or flight response. So I'll see that super commonly in someone's brain map. And that oftentimes ends up resulting in like nervous system burnout. So leading to fatigue, anxiety, depression, PTSD often shows up like that, uh, insomnia, sleep issues. So that is for sure the most common pattern. Also a pattern that I see in a lot of the executive kind of type A peak performer type of people that I see. Yeah. So it's like almost like in a way is like driving them to like succeed and like do all these external accomplishments but then it's also leading to this burnout and feeling of like internal uh not being well because their nervous system's like constantly in in high gear so in those cases we help really teach their brain how to produce more of the slower alpha and theta waves to help balance the brain out crazy all these different waves man dialed in it's cool to see someone so passionate about a topic after doing it for so long and just to see you go deeper into it it's fascinating well what's cool i feel like is that there's like every day like there's so much i don't know about the brain there's so much just we don't know we don't know in general like similar to the microbiome we only know like 20 percent of it that's why i think it's so cool and sometimes frustrating at times but really cool to be in a field like that where it's like you're constantly learning new things it's like you know, like not to, not to knock like a, I don't know, like a, what is it? Kidney doctors, I think are called nephrologists, not to knock nephrologists at all, but I feel like we probably know just about everything there is to know about a kidney, right? Like there's probably not going to be some brand new crazy discovery about a kidney. Meanwhile, with the brain, we don't, we can't even uh, explain like the basic premise of how consciousness works. Like yeah, we can't even understand like how we're able to have this interaction right now, you know, like it's a wild interaction. That's, yeah. <laughs> that is so weird. It's yeah. So weird to think about that. Yeah, for sure. So it's, it's, I love that it's always, there's always more to learn always every day, learning new studies, new research. What, what do you think is going to be sort of like the next level to this? I think democratize access to these neurotechnologies. I think, my goal, you know, and I think the way it can go in the future, just like with most other, I don't even want to call neurofeedback or any of this like a new technology per se, because these have been around since the 1970s. It's just been buried away in research labs and clinics, but I think they're starting to make their way into mainstream awareness. That's certainly what my goal is with my company. And really, I think like a lot of other, you know, technologies that start out, you know, it's kind of a high price point. But as you democratize access, I think it would be incredible if, if every family had a neurofeedback training system, you know, if schools and prisons, like think about how much societal change we could make if we had these technologies in the hands of people who really like need them the most. Totally. So I think hopefully that's the direction that, that we're going to go down. And I think really people have woken up to the dangerous effects side effects as well as long-term repercussions of psychiatric medications like Adderall, like antidepressants. People are wanting a better alternative. So hence people are turning to things like neurofeedback, psychedelics, cold plunges, (laughs) biohacking. So it's like all of that stuff I think is absolutely, and I don't even want to call it the future. It's like the present, but also, also just, I think it'll take, it'll take a lot of years to, to ripple, you know? For sure. Because I think especially like, you know, us having this interaction is one thing, but like, you know, I don't know how your parents feel about this stuff, but like talking to the older generations where they're still so used to just like going to their doctor and believing every single thing they say. And we're like kind of like most people I feel like our age are kind of skeptical of Western medicine and, you know, big pharma. So at least totally. Yeah, Me and Sky talk about this all the time. It's just it's you can't change 
certain parents because it's like bro i've done this for 50 60 years like shut the fuck up like you know that's what they say to a lot of things you know what i mean it's like at this point what's the point but i love the story you mentioned that there's never a bad time to learn there's never a bad time to change like the the studies done to reverse aging the studies done to reverse um all sorts of disease are, are real and it's interesting now, just in terms of the diet world, like right now, a lot of common diets are paleo, keto, and now I'm learning a lot about this lectin avoidance diet, yeah. avoiding lectins, yep. and that lectins are actually a big potential like root cause for a lot of the issues, yeah. and many lectins are in, in fruits that have seeds and vegetables that have seeds, yep. so things like tomatoes, for example, have a lot of seeds, bell peppers, and any form of peppers have these seeds. And the idea is that plants before humans came along uh, were being eaten by animals and they had to develop some sort of defense mechanism to make it so that they didn't want to get eaten by these animals. So they created it inside of these seeds and these seeds then go and attack the host. So those potentially are causing a lot of the inflammation in our body. So all like the healthy stuff that even the people that are super dialed are still sick, we're now just figuring out and it's becoming more widely known that there are much bigger problems to it as well. You yeah. Avoid them lectins, bro. Dude, the nightshades, like, yeah. Pe like foods that you can always thought of as like healthy, right? Like yeah, tomatoes. tomatoes are so fire. I mean, yeah. that's like, what? Dude, I actually like, if I have, so potatoes and beans have a lot of lectins and I will break out, like no matter, I'll have acne tomorrow if I eat a baked potato, whether it's a baked potato or French fries, like potatoes will, will give me acne and then also beans. So yeah, I, I can attest to that firsthand. And the I, biggest issue is that we're not like uh, preparing them properly in the U S right. like they do in Europe and other different co countries, you like, like soaking them, them right? or sprouting so them. Yeah. yeah. I'm still learning about it, but it's fascinating. It's like one of those things that when you have that first experience, mapping out your brain and seeing that things can change. I'm yep. currently going through that like whole shit experience where I could see myself preaching the good word of the health for a long period of time. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have these moments in life when you discover something so wild that you can't stop thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And if you can't stop thinking about it, maybe you should be spending more time on it. Right. Yeah. It's almost like a good relationship. If you can't stop thinking about her, maybe you should call her. I mean, they say that like any, someone who's mastered a skill, you know, it's like from that obsession, right? Where it's like Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, like all these amazing people were not like, oh, I'm going to have a, a work-life balance where I like just <laughs> split up my, no, they're like all in, I'm a hundred percent obsessed, committed. So yeah, man, I think like anyone who becomes really successful at something, they just go all in. So I'm excited to see what, what you end up doing with your health. Let's go. Coaching. Well, speaking of brainwaves, so how does this work? Are we going to run an experiment? Ooh, man, we could definitely do a part two where we do that. Um, I do not have the device with me. Perfect. But I would we're, love we're gonna, to come back and, and you map should, both you, you guys come, maybe some behind the scenes. You should scenes. come on our Sundays. We do recovery Sundays at the okay. crib. And uh, basically we come over, we do the ice bath. We do a guided meditation by sky. We do the sauna. Scott, um, my, my friend brings his chiropractic table so everyone gets adjusted nice. and then you could bring the neurofeedback. That, that's such a cool, fun addition to the recovery Sundays. Let's yeah, do need. it. We should yeah. totally do that. That'd be gnarly. For sure. There's some also like infrared light devices where it's like you can place like helmets on your brain or on your head that target the mitochondria within the brain. And That'd be sweet. For people like if you have like a hangover or any sort of like thing like that, it's like it wakes your brain right back up. So. How wild is it though that we're even saying this type of thing? You know, like back in the day, it's yeah, I'm gonna get fucked up. We're gonna be drinking a lot. We're gonna be doing this, this, and this. Like, but just to get so fired up for recovery Sundays, what a great time to be aligned. <laughs> what is the science and the effects of hangovers on the brain? Why does that happen? Yeah, so alcohol is basically has two main effects where in terms of the neurotransmitter levels, so it's going to drastically increase production of GABA, which is our main inhibitory neurotransmitter that calms and relaxes the nervous system. And then it also causes a decrease in glutamate, which is the main excitatory neurotransmitter. So basically you're having this 
huge imbalance, right? Where there's normally this very delicate, the brain maintains this delicate balance between GABA and glutamate. And then alcohol gives the brain this like double whammy where it jacks up the levels of GABA, diminishes the levels of glutamate, right? And then the next day after you've drank a lot, then there's this huge rebound. So then, so you can think of like drinking is increasing the, the levels of GABA, right? So your brain compensates. It realizes, okay, I don't need to produce my own GABA. So your GABA the next day after drinking is super low and the glutamate is super high. Glutamate, glutamate is actually excitotoxic. It's actually damaging and can cause uh, cell death to neurons. So it's also oftentimes when people have really low levels of GABA, they experience anxiety. So that's a very common thing the next day after drinking, right? Where you experience just kind of that jitteriness and anx anxious feeling, you can't quite settle down. Yeah, That's your your brain having, it's trying to compensate from, from the drinking, but it can really be that, that balance of GABA and glutamate is really messed up, especially like with long-term, you know, alcoholics who maybe they turn to alcohol to try to cope with their anxiety or their sleep issues, right? Because it works in the short term, it's going to calm you down. It's going to, you know, help you relax. But then over time, it's going to actually worsen that imbalance. You're going to diminish your levels of GABA and jack up your levels of glutamate worse and worse over time. So you're actually going to experience a lot more difficulties with whatever you are trying to uh, self-medicate with alcohol, you know, whether that's anxiety or sleep, then you're going to have to start using more and more to get the same effects. And that's that vicious cycle of addiction. So that's how I kind of explain the, you know, the hangover, you know, in, in neurochemical terms, alcohol is also causing a lot of inflammation throughout the, the brain and body. And it's just toxic to pretty much every organ in which it passes through. I know they did a, like a meta analysis where they showed like, like every, literally every organ, like the mouth, the throat, the esophagus or Esophagus? Yeah, esophagus. esophagus. They, they, everything, the stomach, everything that alcohol passed through, it caused organ toxicity. Like every single thing, it causes like damage and cancer. So, what about the thought process that like a glass of wine is technically potentially good for you? Oh, man. I, people really tried to push that narrative. Yeah. Um, and with chocolate, too. <laughs> so, chocolate, chocolate's a different story. I actually think there are a lot of health benefits of chocolate, especially dark chocolate, um, as long as like the sugar in chocolate is kind of problematic, but dark chocolate actually has some different compounds in it, uh, like theobromide, which is kind of a natural, uh, almost like a very similar to caffeine in terms of the stimulating properties and can actually increase uh, nitric oxide production. So helping improve blood flow and oxygen to the brain. So dark chocolate, I'm actually a big fan of, I think it's like a superfood, but red wine, the big, um, the big thing that everyone says, oh, you know, you can get uh, resveratrol from red wine, which is true. There are minute amounts of resveratrol in red wine. Resveratrol is this antioxidant compound that is really, it's almost like deemed like the fountain of youth, yeah. you know, where it's this can, can help, you know, reverse or at least slow down the, the aging process. But the amount of resveratrol that's needed, like as a clinical dose to actually do something you'd have to like drink like way more bottles of wine than it, you'd, you'd die if you got like just to get enough resveratrol for like a single dose that would work you'd have to drink like 70 bottles of wine or like something crazy <laughs> so 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 that that whole argument is like yes there's resveratrol in it yes resveratrol is good for you no there is not enough resveratrol for it to actually do anything clinically significant interesting Unfortunately, are you a big fan of Joe Dispenza? Oh yeah. Yeah. I love Joe's Dr. Joe's work. And that's like, honestly, the, anyone who has heard about brain mapping, I feel like it's usually from watching that rewired series. Cause he has a whole episode where he focuses all on the brain waves right. and talking, you know, they actually show he actually did brain mapping or does brain mapping at his retreats. So that's yeah, fascinating, he's, he's so. done a lot of, of, for the field, um, in terms of just helping popularize this stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's where I know Anton was working with him for a long time and he completely changed after working with that guy. I mean, he was, he got, he became so dialed from that experience. Right. And, and I mean, that's, that was the idea of, you know, 
coming into Anton's retreat and doing the brain mapping, you know, is providing those same, same evaluations. Of, yeah. yeah. Cause I know Anton, you guys are the new Dr. wave, Joe. baby. Try to be. Let's Try to go. Be. I love yes, it. Sir. It's great to see all of these, uh, these people stepping into these, these new roles and all of it comes down to holistic health and what can we do to feel better and, and just feel better about ourselves. I mean, that's ultimately what I want to do. It's ultimately what we strive to do because Every day when you wake up and you're just having a really, really good day, it's like the greatest thing ever. Mm. I'm a big fan of Whoop. Yeah. Um, I have a Whoop and a bunch of my friends have them now and we're in the different Whoop teams. And it's crazy how accurate Whoop is to how I feel that day. I hear, I, I got a, I'm team Aura right now, but oh, nice. I, I hear, I hear Whoop's better. So like I, I definitely. Well, Aura's better for sleep. For, oh, that's what someone told me. Okay. Yeah, or is so, money for sleep. So what, what, as far as like when you feel a certain way that you're saying it's right on the money, like what is the whoop telling so you? So like that? right now my recovery is 43%. Okay. Uh, last night it was two nights ago. It was 89% in okay. the green. And I was just like, whoop, 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 feeling good. I felt strong. Like I literally can feel my muscles. Like either like, I feel like, like a, like a strong big guy, or I just kind of feel like a, like a squirrel or like a shrunken <laughs> lobster, okay. you know, like, I, but last night I got eight hours of sleep, but I ate sweet potatoes and I haven't eaten sweet potatoes in a long time. And I, I, I recently, <laughs> let's go back a step. I recently did a colonic <laughs> and a colonic is literally when they stick a tube up your butt and they fill you up with water and allow you to, um, excrete the, basically cleanse your, your large intestine. And the idea taking another step back about colonics is that the intestines are like the sewer of the body. We as homeowners have to clean our septic tanks every year to make sure that the septic tank is clean and there's, there's no like um, anything getting stuck in the, in the pipes. Same concept with our colons. We never clean out our colons. And it's obviously sounds really ridiculous to like pump something up your butt, like what the fuck. But Things like enemas and coffee enemas are yeah. quickly becoming some of the greatest forms of relief. So I recently did a colonic and it was a very interesting experience. It's not comfortable, but I was blown away with how much crud shit, candida mm. came out of my body. And I already had, you know, fasted two days before. So I already had went to the bathroom a lot and there was like another five to six pounds of shit that came out of Damn. me. Damn. So is it a coffee enema that you did or I just did a colonic. I've actually, what's the difference? Coffee enemas are actually using coffee, like right. literally ground coffee beans. Right. Like you make coffee uh-huh. and you put coffee. I've there. done coffee enemas. Yeah. Okay. So, so what, what is a, cl- a, a colonic, colonic is just enema. water that it's just water. Oh, okay. But I actually haven't been able to do it myself. Like I, I just couldn't get myself to like shove it up <laughs> my own butt. <laughs> like I just right. couldn't do it. So <laughs> And I remember I was like so sad back when I was very sick with SIBO. And I just said to myself, like, I can't even stick this thing up my butt. Like, I, I'm not going to ever get better. It sucked. So I said, fuck it. I'm going to go and get a colonic because if someone else shoves it up there, I should probably be OK. <laughs> and I did that literally five, six days ago. And that happened. And I've been feeling amazing ever since, like amazing amazing and i know it's because my tubes just got flushed and i think full circle with all of this i forgot completely where i was going what were we talking about right before that my brain scan is going to show short-term memory <laughs> loss let's think about colonics <laughs> oh just man i don't even know what yeah coffee i don't enemas, even know. but yeah i don't even know coffee enemas yeah. um it's interesting that we're, we're learning so much about cleansing our bodies and making sure that everything is flowing naturally. I think that's where we're going at. There was another yeah. path, but I totally lost it. Yeah. No, yeah. I know. I know with the coffee enemas, it increases the production of glutathione like 700%, which is a crazy amount. And glutathione's like our ma- uh, master antioxidant. So super important for the immune system, for the brain. So I don't know uh, if, if just a regular colonic has similar sort of effects, but I, I for sure agree with you that like these, these sort of alternative, you know, health modalities, which, I mean, they were used, I, I read about coffee enemas had been used since like a really, really yeah. like ancient times, like as, as totally. medicine. So I feel like that's like all these biohacking things like PEMF, right? It's like basically just grounding, like walking outside barefoot, like all these things that are currently huge in biohacking are just like, getting back to nature, right? I mean, paleo, yeah. the whole 
paleo diets, just like reverting back to what our ancestors ate. But it's crazy because something like a colonic, if I had done that back when I had SIBO, I probably would have saved years of just terribleness that I had mm. experience. Because we just, like, when you went to a gastroenterologist, they would not recommend the elemental diet. They would not recommend anything that wasn't a pill. Mm. And it's gnarly that we've gotten to a point in society where all we do is recommend pills. But now this new generation of thinkers and biohackers is starting to get data that's obviously better in many ways that things that are these natural things like enemas and stuff are going to be great. Well, enema is not technically natural, but the fact that we've done these for a long time. What's the thing when you prick people? Um, acupuncture. Acupuncture. What are your thoughts on acupuncture? Yeah, so it definitely like... Uh, I mean, it definitely works. I think like, even uh, insurance companies are starting to reimburse for acupuncture. So yeah. it's definitely moved almost into mainstream medicine, I'd say. But specifically talking about like the neurochemical effects, it causes our body to release a lot of endorphins, which are like our natural opioids. So it's incredible for pain relief because all of those little pokes that is kind of, you know, causing this little bit of pain response which causes our body to pump out all these natural endorphins, which are really combating pain, giving us that euphoria. I mean, I don't know, like if you, I did it once, dude, it's like you, like I always like feel like I'm like drifting off, like in this like amazing, like, like, well, it's crazy when they put them like, not obviously in your eye, but she put them close. I know what she means. It's like, damn girl. Yeah. Yeah. There's needles. Dude, I got to get like super, maybe at some point I'll like, become like an oriental medicine doctor or something in the future i don't know like that stuff's so interesting to me i like i feel like there's like so many uh acupuncture points and meridians and it all makes sense and i feel like it's like eastern medicine has it like so much more dialed in you know at least when it comes to like chronic conditions like because yeah western medicine's like if you break your leg you know it's great you know if you want to the hospital doctor. and get an x-ray but for all these chronic conditions, I think things like acupuncture and, you know, enemas, all this stuff like should be really what's done because it's, it's the most effective. I think. What do we all think about energy healing specifically how certain people have really bad energy and it almost can like muck up your energy. And if you're around certain people with bad energy, it's like all over you and you have to like cleanse your body to get rid of that energy and that certain people you meet, have such high levels of energy that you can't even help but almost notice it and even say something because they're just like peaking. Got to get rid of the energy vampires. I heard my buddy <laughs> called that. But um, but yeah, no, I mean, so there's the mirror neuron system in the brain, uh, these set of, of brain cells that actually pick up and emulate what other people are, are doing or, or how they're behaving. So that's why if we walk into a room and you know, we see our friend and they're, you know, in a really great mood and maybe we're not in the best headspace, they can really cheer us up. And on the flip side, if we're doing well, having a great day, and then, you know, someone's a a Debbie Downer and, you know, they kind of mess up our energy. There's, there's absolutely, you know, hardcore uh, neuroscience to back that up. Um, Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's a lot as far as like, what actually goes into like energy healing where it's like i'm not i feel like i'm not convinced one way or another where there's like when you when you first said energy healing i thought like reiki and like other other forms of modalities but what there's there's this one really crazy one where it's like people have these like convulsions have you ever heard of like kundalini kundalini, kundalini yoga kundalini yoga think, yeah yeah, yeah. Well, where, kundalini is more of breath work but there's, yeah, it's like something where people have, like, they're, like, shaking. You, you know what I mean? Where they're, like... Yeah, let me, let me get more information on that while you guys talk. Yeah, I I don't know. I, like, I have I have a couple friends who, who are into that space. And, like, I don't know. Personally, I feel like it doesn't really, like, affect me too much. But my girlfriend actually had, like, a Reiki session done um, on her. And, like, she was actually, like, like, the Reiki practitioner, like, put her hands, like, over her, like, heart area and she was like 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 not even touch her chest whatsoever and she was like she said that like physically she was like still like she felt pain there like even after the session was over so like i don't want to like knock it i'm just like i personally haven't 
haven't like experienced any anything crazy but well it's interesting because if you get to a point where you can really detox everything in your body like deep detox and you're and you've been doing it for a really long time you become more sensitive and aware to energy from what i've been reading and from Mm -hmm. the people that do it and it's almost like you know those people i guess the aubrey marcuses of the world that are just so you know spitting some serious waka flocka Mm -hmm. energy flames (laughs) <laughs> you know, it, you don't even under, you can't understand it unless your body's even capable of underst- of feeling it. I guess one thing, I, I definitely believe it's real, not even a question. It's like sometimes if you take your hands and you put them above someone else's hands, like an inch apart, and you just hold them for a little while, you can start to feel the energy almost coming off of them. It's kind of a, a gnarly little situation if you just do this while someone else does this like really close and you hold it for a little while, your hands almost start to get tingly. Mm. I wonder if that's due to that. I think it is, but it's interesting. It's just definitely something that I want to learn more about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think it's just like, they talk about like, you know, you're the average, like the five people that you surround yourself with the most. Right. And it's like, if you surround yourself with people who are always complaining about things and kind of have poor energy, it's easy to get like sucked into that that space, you know, whereas I think like being around people who are going to bring you up and positive, like not saying like you got to always be positive. Like I think like there's definitely times where it's totally. appropriate to like, you know, be sad or whatever. But, um, just in general, I think like energy is, is huge. Well, overcoming the colonic has made me more open to all this new shit now. I'm like, yeah. okay, if I can do the colonic, maybe next boofa. <laughs> man we'll have to have to get you hooked up <laughs> here's a question so this is something we always ask all of our guests that come on the show yeah. if you could have gone back in time and you could have talked to yourself back when you had the huge social anxiety maybe you're 14 15 years old and you could have had a minute with that that younger version of yourself and you could have told them something that could have saved you a ton of time money heartache headache any of that stuff mm. you know what's maybe something that you would have told them Man, definitely that you're experiencing the issues that you are because of the way your brain is operating on a biological level, that this is not actually who you are deep down as a person. When I was able to separate the two and realize that Toby as a person was not this socially awkward, anxious individual, but that that was the result of my brain misfiring because of past traumas and situations in my life that it conditioned my brain to always be in that fear response when I was able to actually separate it and realize that you know these were issues that I was dealing with because of biological problems I think that's what really allowed me to then realize okay well how do I how do I change the biology because I, at the time, I think like always just viewed it as this is who I am. Like I'm just awkward and anxious. And like, I think so many people who have, you know, so many people cling to their diagnoses. Like I work with so many clients who were given a diagnosis of depression and they feel as though they they identify with it so closely. They feel like they're going to deal with it the rest of their life. And that's just like who they are and who their parent was. And they're become almost addicted to it. They feel it. Yeah, exactly. So I think just like breaking that addiction in a way of just like separating who you are kind of deep down as a person and what you're, what symptoms you're experiencing when you can separate the two, that's what allowed me to really change so much. So I would say just understanding that, you know, the issues that you're experiencing back 10 years ago were the result of you know, why, or, you know, my brain not firing properly on a biological level and knowing that there's actually something to do about it and to change it, man, I would have, I would have felt so much more hopeful that I was going to live this awesome life in the future. Man, it's been such a joy meeting you. This is, this is a pleasure. I mean, I can't begin to say thank you so much for making this happen. I know Sky, I was super stoked to have you come through, myself included, and just for you to be able to impart this, this is something none of us have ever heard of. None of us have ever done. And you just opened the can of worms through a whole new stuff. So I'm stoked for us to chill more recovery Definitely. Sundays. You're absolutely invited the next one. Yeah. And, uh, 
man, I, I'm I'm excited for round two in the future. Definitely, man. How, I, how can everyone follow you? How can people follow the journey? And, and where would you direct them? Yeah, so definitely connect with me on Instagram. Uh, Neuroflex is the tag. Uh, I'm super responsive on there. So I'd be super curious if anyone has any questions, comments, any feedback. Um, do you want to hate on the episode? Well, no, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Send anything my way. Um, so I'm happy to talk to people there. And you can also go to www.neuroflex.tech, T-E-C-H. That's the website. Read up about all of these things. But yeah, really the Instagram page is a good place for people to start. And just like you're saying, man, there's so many people that can benefit that I know without a doubt can benefit from this stuff. But how are you going to benefit from something you don't even know exists? So my message is really why I'm doing this stuff, why I'm getting on these podcasts is trying to actually spread the words so that more people can spend more of their life happy and healthy and not have to suffer from mental health issues like social anxiety, like, like I did in the past. So I really thank you for having me on the show. Really enjoyed all your questions and I'm definitely there for recovery Sunday and Let's round go, two coming baby. up. We appreciate you, man. Till next time. Absolutely.